rally after rally, we're going to bring our membership together, we're going to try and recruit, we're going to excite people, we're going to talk to them, but above all else, we're going to listen. He said, okay, we'll go around together. I said, don't be ridiculous, it looked like last of summer wine, I'm true. <laughs> <laughs> left thing where you book a room for you know a hundred and you make sure the chairs are not fixed so if only 20 turn up you can move them about and so <laughs> we did our first meeting and did exactly that 500 people turned up and then so we booked for 500 and a thousand turned up and it went on like that and there's a brilliant video there's a brilliant film of the Camden Bidra Centre um, meeting in, in central London where 2,000 are in the hall and outside the street is packed we get the FBU fire engine and Jeremy addresses the street with the fire engine and there's two young people two young people film breaking into the hall not breaking out <laughs> and it was just extraordinary extraordinary campaign you were all many of you were, were part of it and the nature of that campaign was yes the formal hustings but the rallies were more important in the sense that to enable people to turn up and express their views about what was happening in their lives and in the real world. And that shaped our physical programme that came out of that leadership election. People were turning up and explaining what was happening in, in their particular area. One of the big issues that came up right away across the country was housing. And I'll tell you what it's like in my constituency tonight, there'll be 200 families sleeping in bed and breakfast. There'll be people sleeping in sheds and garages rented out to them. We've reinvented the back-to-back -back in my constituency where people sleep in one part of the house and rent it and then rent out the back as well. Because why? Because for 30 years we haven't built council houses. Mm -hmm. So what the policy was, and straightforwardly, we said straightforward our programme then, we will build council houses again and we'll call them council houses. <laughs> showed us what sort of pressure that they were under, under the NHS as it had been after years of austerity, the cutbacks that had taken place, the PFIs that happened, the backdoor privatisations, and the, well, the suffering actually that was going on, not just by the patients but also by the staff because of the pressure they were under. The stress levels, not seen before, to be honest, on a scale that we had. So we said very, very straightforward, they well as part of our programme, we will end all the privatisation of the NHS. We will <laughs> and we supported the Alison Pollock Bill, which actually brought in a reorganisation of the NHS, not top ground, but from a grassroots in which workers, local councils, and local communities will take back the NHS into democratic control and plan the future of their services, linking it to care, properly invested in through local authorities as well. Yes. We had we had trade unions turn up right away across the industry and in different sectors as well to explain what it was like to be a trade unionist in this country at the moment. Well, we don't even meet the international labour organisation conventions that apply right away across Europe itself. What the anti-trade union laws have done since, since the 1980s, and what they've done for the first time in a generation, maybe I think since the Second World War, for the first time now in our the the distribution of GDP, the distribution of income of this country, more is going now to shareholders than it is to the workers themselves. It's the first time since the Second World War, if not before. And that's as a result of the undermining of collective bargaining and the undermining of trade union rights. We used to have two thirds of our workforce in this country covered by collective bargaining agreements. It's now down to about 20%. So what has that meant? Actually, it's meant for a long period of time now Wages have been frozen, but there's certain groups within our society which hit the hardest. We know now from the IFS figures last week, young people since 2008, 7% cut in their incomes as a result of what's been happening. And then we saw the threat coming up, we knew what the Tories were going to do in terms of the trade union bill that's now become a trade union act, which is an existential threat to trade unionism. So what we said very straightforwardly, if the act goes, if the bill goes through and now it's an act, we gave a commitment. In the first hundred days of the Labour government, we will scrap the trade union act. basis of the abiding by international labour organisation conventions and ensure 
of those rights, that, that those rights that we've built up over generations have built upon that. So they're positive rights of engagement within their companies. I, interestingly enough, I welcome Theresa May's uh, conversion to having workers on board. We'll see what she means by it. <laughs> I'll tell you what we mean by it. We mean a proper engagement of the process where workers are involved in the breach of the management of their companies, they determine rates of pay at all levels, and they're fully engaged in the investment decisions in the long term. That's the sort of trade union legislation that will be bringing about a positive engagement with the economy, not just a protective role that trade unions can play. We then had people turning up who, who, who were concerned about what was happening in terms of peace and justice across the world. And of course, um, the biggest, I think, stain on the last Labour government was Iraq. And here's the irony. I, if, because I've been involved in Irish politics for a long period of time, I have nothing but respect for what Tony Blair did in terms of the Northern Ireland peace process. And if, if it had ended at that, if he'd have ended his role in terms of peacemaking, in terms of conflict prevention and conflict resolution, at that stage, I think I would have gone down in history as a remarkable Prime Minister. Yeah. And then Iraq comes, and to be frank, never again, never again should we ever enter into a military adventure like Iraq at the behest of a foreign government to satisfy, quite honestly, one of the most right-wing regimes in terms of the Bush regime in America. <laughs> discussions around public ownership and the anomalies. We had a large number of workers from across the transport sector in particular about what was happening with buses and what happened in rail. And the, the irony that here we are, a party which would argue for nationalisation and um, public ownership of, of transport in particular and natural assets. And here we were faced with a Conservative government actually that in many ways had nationalised more, so George Osborne nationalised more, more elements of our transport system than we ever dreamt of. But the problem was he nationalised them to the Germans, the Dutch, and every other. <laughs> and then, this is where Red Books come into it, then he started with the Chinese Communist Party, selling off assets. And then, as a result of that, we now, partly as a result of that, we now have a current account deficit, which in the old, in the old terms of balance of trade is our worst in our history. And part of that is as a result of our assets being sold off and a wrongly attacked establishment because in uh, over, overtaking our economy where profits are sucked out of, earned in this country, but sucked out as a result of selling off so many assets and sucked abroad. So that was the programme that we built up really as a result of the debate, discussion and the rallies that took place and that's the programme that Jeremy got elected upon, as was said, on an overwhelming, overwhelming mandate that was achieved. What did he do after that? He did what all Labour Prime Ministers have done in the past if they want to succeed, he put together a shadow cabinet of left, right and centre. Because actually that's the sort of broad coalition we are. We are a broad church and you have to respect that. And that's what he did. There were some people who refused to serve and that was a shame and that was regrettable but we put that together. But to be frank, what we're witnessing at the moment, as you know, is a very British coup. Yeah. And it started two minutes into Jeremy's acceptance speech. Yeah. Because when he started speaking, you, you will have seen across the television screens statements being made by people resigning, refusing to serve, and the criticism started in two minutes of him starting that speech. And there is a small minority, an extremely small minority in the Parliamentary Labour Party that, that has not come to terms with Jeremy's mandate. The vast bulk of the Parliamentary Labour Party, up until the referendum, actually we're just getting on with the job and we were involving them in determining policy and implementation of policy and actually, yes, we were laying the foundations for the future, a good working relationship. But there's been a small group who've been plotting literally since the day Jeremy got elected. And they're not, I watch my language, they're just not very good at plotting. <laughs> <laughs> at first, because they tell us. <laughs> The first attempted coup was meant to be after the Oldham by-election because it was predicted that the Oldham by-election would be a disaster, it demonstrated we couldn't win elections, and the first attempt at the coup was not likely to take place then. Well, we went to Oldham and we had a fantastic local candidate, and we won Oldham with 
huge majority. Why? Because we combined the really good local candidate with a new enthusiasm that was brought to the Labour Party as well by Jeremy Corbyn, the Corbynist of Momentum and others. And that it was the traditional Labour Party members with a great local candidate working with our new members and many of them in new, older members enthused as well, campaigning that to live that result. So the next coup attempt was meant to be after the local government elections and the mayor elections, because we were bound to lose those well. <laughs> as has been said, we won every mayor election. And it wasn't just the celebrations in London. I tell you the one I celebrated the most was Marvin Rees in Bristol. <laughs> city which built its wealth on slavery, demonstrated as a society just how far we've come and just what a wonderful city it is to, to actually vote in that way for equality. So that was a fantastic picture. And in the local council elections, where we expected to lose council after council, we held on to every council and we matched Ed Miliband's best performance ever when he was 18 points ahead of the depth of the recession. So the coup didn't happen then. <laughs>